WNST, Towson, Baltimore, and Baltimore Positive. I'm back on the homestead. Uh, I've brought my mask back from the Maryland Lottery. I got it all washed up. We're going to be doing the Maryland Crab Cake Tour beginning on March 4th at Mama's on the Half Shell down in Canton, Maryland. And Don Moeller and I got together uh, sometime back in early January. We made this long list of folks we were going to have on in 2022. Some of them running for office. Some of them used to run for office. Some of them are on TV. And some of them even had a crab cake with me last summer on the Maryland Crab Cake Tour. I think she checks all the boxes, Don. I think it's going here. Some, some are on TV, right, for the Washington Post, and are running for office, and have actually been in office before. Our good friend, Congresswoman Donna Edwards. Welcome back to Baltimore Positive, Congresswoman. Thanks so much. It's really great to be with you all. And I was thinking about those crab cakes this morning. <laughs> well, you know, listen, I went up the road about a week later and I had a crab cake with Michael Steele uh, at Jerry's and Laura. It turns out the place oh, you yeah. and I went, owned by the same people, different recipes. Everyone has a different crab cake. So I would say sometime in August, I'm doing 31 crab cakes in 31 days. I will get back down to Prince George's, we don't, I'm not allowed to call it PG. I get slapped every time I do that. But your Prince buddy, George Michael is, Steele. As you should be. Um, <laughs> Michael, your buddy, Michael Steele, the former lieutenant governor, smacked him upside down. <laughs> all, around, all around. Congresswoman, let's jump right into, first of all, once again, A plus on the Room Raider. And you can tell someone who's a veteran of campaigns when they've got the campaign sign strategically <laughs> placed over the shoulder. Well, well done. Well done. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. You were there for eight years, what I'll call looking back the glory years of the Obama era. Uh, you are choosing to go try to go back at a time when many others are saying, get me the hell out of Dodge. Why do you want to go back to a place that appears to be totally dysfunctional? Um, because our republic requires it, to be quite honest with you. I mean, I really do feel that both for our congressional district in terms of being able to deliver for the district and for the state of Maryland, um, but also for the nation, that um, right now is not a time to run away from the fire. It's a time to run toward it. Um, we are faced with tremendous crises, not the least of which are um, our economic challenges that we are having uh, now and people's lives are at stake and their livelihoods, um, but also the Republic. Um, you know, I can still remember the time when I was, I think about four or five years old, sitting on the top steps of the Capitol, looking out at the Supreme Court with my dad in his Air Force uniform you know, just thinking about, you know, just loving being there, never imagining that I would actually go to work at the Capitol. And right now that Republic that my father gave 30 years of his life uh, defending and protecting is in jeopardy. Uh, Congresswoman, the last six years, you, you've been on television, those watch MSNBC or see clips or follow you on Twitter. I, dare I say what's been the most disturbing part of all of this since you left and uh, and 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 became a pundit, quite frankly, I mean, to literally on a daily basis fly in for any point over the four years uh, and then the insurrection, all of these really unthinkable things. I think if we had gotten together six years ago and said, well, what's the worst thing that could happen? Well, plague, COVID, uh, internal civil war of some kind that's gone on here the last six years. Was there a moment where you're like, all right, I'm, I'm going back, that I'm going to do this again? Or was this sort of a slow burn for you? Well, I think in some ways it took some getting used to. I mean, during the Trump years, um, I think I remember every week saying to myself, it can't be worse. It can't be worse. And it was worse every single week of that administration. Uh, in television, you know, Fridays normally can be very slow news days. Sometimes uh, politicians count on slow news day Fridays. And during the Trump years, every Friday was a news day. Um, every because, day was a Friday. <laughs> that's right, because because he because he did some things that were unprecedented, unchecked, um, unimaginable, and uh, illegal. You know, I, by the way, too, we say that. Illegal. That's right, we can say that. I think I was one of the early ones in a column that I wrote in the Washington Post after Michael Cohen um, uh, you know, became a 
person of interest and then testified. He was in front of the Congress at the time. And I wrote a column then saying that Donald Trump should be impeached. He was already named as um, you know, a, a number one un, unindicted, you know, co-conspirator or whatever they call it um, in the Cohen um, documents. And I thought you cannot have a president of the United States who, as a rule, obstructs justice, gets in the way, um, lies, cheats, commits fraud. That's not that does not define who a president of the United States is. And so I called for his impeachment very early on. Um, but I could see it happening. I think I told you this, that when I came out of Congress, I did a road trip in my RV around the country. And um, because I really wanted to understand what was going on. And I spent four, four and a half, almost four months actually on the road in my RV, state and local roads all through the um, Southern states, all of those states in between that people describe as flyover states. Um, along the southern border. And I talked to people, and most of these were Trump people who were in the camp, in the RV campgrounds. And I talked to them about what their concerns were, why they were angry, why they voted for, uh, for Donald Trump. And I had a sense right then, and that was, you know, January to um, almost April in 2017. And I had a sense right then that this was not going to be the end. That, um, you know, sitting on on inauguration day um, down in south in the southern part of Florida, I was watching the inauguration and I heard um, him, you know, talk about um, the the American carnage and people around that campground. They were cheering him on. I think I was the only one who was like completely mortified by what I was hearing in an inauguration. And so it may have started out as a slow burn, but it really quickly became a raging fire. Boy, that that image, Congresswoman, that you just mentioned is the one that probably keeps me up at night more than anything else. And that's the image of the people sitting around a campfire cheering on an American carnage speech. And and again, for our listeners, I, I know it's painful to do so, but occasionally go back on YouTube and watch some of that speech again. It, it I don't think it's hyperbole to say that's one of the darkest days, that inaugural speech in the United States of America for its tone. And and, and it set the tone, by the way. It set the tone. Well, that's where I'm going. It was where, predictive. It was predictive that, of what would happen. With, without a doubt. And Nestor, that's where I was heading. And I want to ask the Congresswoman, because there are so many issues she's going to have to prioritize if she reenters the halls of Congress. But Nestor talked about your Twitter feed and talking about that speech being predicted, predictive. You recently retweeted something. And I thought, ah, oh, I'm, I'm guessing my friend is is exaggerating a bit. I said, I'm I'm going to I'm going to check this retweet out. I, she must be having some Democratic fun uh, exaggerating what I'm about to say. And you retweeted something that showed a candidate for office in Arizona taking a rifle down the middle of an old West town and shooting. Mark Kelly, right. the senator from Arizona, whose wife was shot. And he's running that proudly as a TV ad because he thinks that will resonate with voters. Forget his degradation at making the ad. He believes, Congresswoman, that will register with voters. So what, am I describing the ad correctly? You and are. How do you, how do you respond to that? But it's all, but it isn't, it wasn't even just that. And, you know, to my former colleague and actually my um, seated partner, she, uh, Gabby Giffords was my classmate. I came in in that class. We sat next to each other um, on this uh, science, space and technology uh, committee. And uh, for him, for this candidate to run that ad, um, thinking that he's going to garner votes by projecting violence against the husband sitting senator and husband of a woman who was shot 
um, when she was just serving her constituents. It's abhorrent. But that wasn't the only one uh, done because there have been other ads that have been cut in re Republican primaries with Nancy Pelosi as a target, with yeah. Chuck Schumer as a target. This has become a thing uh, with today's Republican Party. And it's it's frightening. But we there live people in sending out family Christmas cards all with machine guns. I mean, machine it's insane. Guns. Right. And so I, I worry, part of you asked me why would I want to go back into a Congress at this moment in time? And I think that it is because it's important for us to stand up for the, you know, 66 to 75% of the American public who is not on that train. And our voices have to be made louder and made clearer because um, that is not that is not where the majority of the American people are, and whatever rock they crawled out from under, uh, we want them to crawl back. And, Amen. Uh, and, and 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 I love that. you know what I love about you, Congressman. You don't hold back. I don't. I don't think that Donna. Edwards, you ought to be on TV. She's. I'm going to get. She ought to be on TV. She ought to write a column. But well, I, I I think I, I think what I just saw as we as I walked in here. And I think you have this, and I want to ask you to react to something that the congressman from New York, Sean Patrick Maloney, said this morning on your network, on MSNBC. And I thought, I said to my wife as I was getting ready to come up here, I said, there we go. He is singing my song. I've been beating this drum till I make people sick. And he said, what Democrats have to do better is they have to pass the Maloney brothers test. And I thought, the Maloney brothers test. He said, I'm the youngest of five. And the first Thanksgiving I went back after being elected to Congress, the other four said, oh God, there he goes. He's already talking like, quote unquote, an a-hole. And he said, their message was, don't go down there and speak in a way that nobody understands. Democrats have this wonk, 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 wonk. Republicans are great at simple messages, no matter how much those simple messages may not may not make any sense to us. It does resonate to your people around the campground. I get a sense that when you go back, you're going to do, in terms of the old Harry Truman, a little straight talk express and tell it like it is. Now, having said that, what issues are you going to be talking about? Well, I, I'm glad that you raised that because um, both in my congressional district, but we can see around our state that um, we have deep needs. I mean, we have people who are doing really, really well, but we have a lot of people who are not doing well at all. And especially in this, um, in this economy that is a COVID economy. And this COVID economy is going to remain with us um, for a while. We're going to be recovering from that. And I think it's going to be really important that as Marylanders, um, that we recover in a way that puts us um, in the forefront of the 21st century. And that means getting all of the transportation resources we need. Um, you know, you recall that when Larry Hogan came in as governor, he rejected the money for the red line in Baltimore. That was a huge, in my view, that was a huge mistake. It would have created jobs and opportunity um, for uh, for people in Baltimore. And by but the way, that's not politically expedient for you to say that. I mean, right? No, I mean, for not. no one I mean, in Baltimore, gonna... this is Baltimore against the whole state right. is how I felt as a Baltimore resident the last two decades. I felt like there's sort of a gang tackle that happens that sort of politically you have to be online with bring it to my county, bring it to my district no, instead of I the mean, other district. You know what? There's enough for all of us. Right. I mean, we're developing the purple line in Prince George's and Montgomery County because we want to make sure that we're developing clean transportation, that people have a, a way to you know, get around to their to their jobs and their neighborhoods uh, without just getting in their cars. And there's, there was enough money for the purple line and there was enough money for the red line. This is not a competition. What it makes Baltimore strong, Prince George's County and Montgomery County have an economy that's really driving uh, the state. I mean, we're one, we are really just, you know, one state. Um, and so I, I think that things like that are about the past 
and not about the future. And we have to make investments in infrastructure that are about our future. We have failing bridges in the state. We have you know, roads that are have not been repaired. And we have a deep need for public, public transit and clean public transit. And those are issues that I think are important to people in my congressional district because we drive everywhere. Um, because um, it, it, you know, if you wanna get to your child's um, soccer game or you know, softball game, you're spending hours to try to get from work to, you know, to your neighborhood and a game, and you may miss that first or second inning where your child hits the, um, you know, the grand slam home run. I'm speaking as a parent to whom that happened. Um, and <laughs> sure. so, you know, so I think those issues are important. I also think housing needs are very important. So many people are moving farther and farther away, moving away from transportation because they're trying to afford their, um, their livelihood. And then, you know, in, in Congress, we think sometimes that things like climate change don't really apply to us, but in fact they do. And some of the deepest impacts of the changes that are happening in our climate happen to low income people, to people of color. And so we have to focus on climate change in a way that people understand. It's about their health. It's about, you know, your child with asthma and lead poisoning and all of those environmental justice issues um, that really resonate with communities. And so I'm excited about, uh, about this campaign. Um, I approach it very differently, frankly, than I approached my service from 2008 to, uh, to 2017. And part of that is because I've learned and I've grown and I've also been at a distance. And I think that that's given me a lot of perspective about the institution, about the way that it should work, about our responsibility to defend and protect the Republic and about my commitment to serve the people of my congressional. Wait, let, let me, let we're, me we're jump chatting in. with Go Donna ahead, Fern Edwards. Uh, you can find her on MSNBC, find her down in the uh, Maryland fourth congressional district. She is running for office. Go ahead, Don. Now, I was going to say that that point that you just talked about how Congress is different, certainly from when you were there in 08, and probably very different back, you know, in the Clinton years and in, in the, in the early nineties, uh, my question for you, and I, I think I think it is one that rational people on both sides of the aisle are struggling with, and that is this: is it is the concept of bipartisanship dead? Does it still matter, and is it still possible? To me, I put that front and center, Congresswoman. What's your take on that? Because I want it not to be dead, but I'm just not sure. Well, it's fragile um, right now. I think many of the many Republicans who you know were willing to work across the aisle are departing um, the uh, the Congress, and so that is a concern. It matters who Republicans nominate in these districts and the attitude with which they come into their um, into their service. But I don't think I do think it's still possible. One of the best things that I've done since I um, left Congress is to work with a group called the United States Association of Former Members of Congress. And they are Republicans and Democrats. And every single thing that we do um, in the FMC is bipartisan. We've joined together um, for, to write um, friends of the court briefs to the Supreme Court in defense of Congress's authority. We've joined together to visit college campuses, Republicans and Democrats because it's important to show the next generation um, that uh, it's possible for people to disagree um, on policy issues, but not to disagree personally. And I'm, I'm committed to finding, even if it's a handful of them, to finding Republicans who are willing uh, to work across the aisle. I used to do that a lot with Barbara Comstock, who is a Republican from, uh, from Virginia. We worked on a lot of transportation issues um, together. Um, I worked on legislation dealing with uterine fibroids with Shelley Moore Capito, who's the Republican Senator um, uh, from West Virginia. So I do think it is still possible. I don't think it's dead, but I do think it requires a commitment of people who are servant leaders, who are public servants, who are willing to commit themselves uh, to working together for the good of the American people. And you know what they say, Don, there's no such thing 
as a Republican road or a bridge that's falling apart. So Ke- Ke- Kevin, Ke- it's etched in my brain. Ke- my buddy Kevin Kamenitz, you say there aren't there aren't Republican potholes and Democratic potholes. There aren't Republican schools to fix and Democratic schools to fix. They're just issues to be addressed. He he would say that. Uh, over his yogurt every morning while you and I were having scrapple at the double T uh, and he was on his, on his health kick. You know, one of the issues that Nestor you guys and I eat have, scrapple, you're the ones that are here. I just find that to we, be unbelievable. We, we love our scrapple. Kevin's <laughs> laughing somewhere, say? you know, at that, right. <laughs> you know, Nestor and I, and I have spent a lot of time talking about public safety. And I think one of the things that Democrats get pigeonholed on, I, I wrote about this recently is It's ridiculous to think that you can't stand against police abuse and also believe our streets ought to be safe. Well, the governor of the state takes that, you know, refund, refund, defund, defund, and that's that's how he gets how he wins elections. Quite frankly, it's just insincere, and particularly when you're talking about a party that publicly now and officially, as the RNC, thinks insurrection is legitimate political discourse. As I said in the article that I wrote, the, the, the Republicans now side with the Proud Boys instead of the FOP. So that should be an easy one for Democrats. But you, when you were in Congress before, you got into something that Nestor's been adamant about since day one. And that was you fought for Pell Grants for prisoners back when you were in Congress uh, you know, a decade ago. And I, I want you to talk about that concept and broaden it a little bit, because one of the things that Nestor has spoken about over and over is that we do a lousy job of getting our prison population ready to reenter society so that it's not surprising that they end up back in prison. And we should be able to do that much better. And when I looked and saw how you fought for those Pell Grants, a decade ago, I thought, well, the Congresswoman was ahead of the curve. Well, I, uh, thanks very much for recognizing that. I mean, I did. I visited Jessup Prison, um, where they have a program that's um, being done with Goucher Co- College, where the professors come in and they teach and they educate. And, um, and Pell Grants used to be available for the incarcerated population, and they were taken away in the 90s. And I think that that was a huge mistake. And so I worked hard um, to try to restore Pell Grant eligibility. We're not there yet. That's one of the things that I will fight for when I get back into Congress, because I think, you know, we all know that education is a key um, to not just reentering society, but making a commitment, paying taxes, buying homes, all of those things depend on getting a good education. And I think Um, You know, there are some talented people among uh, the criminal set. And why not turn those talents for, you know, math and science and all of that, turn it into something productive and give people an opportunity for an education. And so I'm absolutely committed to that. But on the broader question of justice system reform, look, I cut my teeth doing anti-domestic violence work. And one of the biggest pieces of my work was doing training of law enforcement to train and retrain law enforcement to undo the stereotypes about how and why and when you respond to domestic violence incidents, to unlearn those behaviors of walking the guy around the block and then putting him right back in the house again so that uh, he could abuse. I worked on issues of getting rid of police officers who had misdemeanor domestic violence offenses, um, keeping them from carrying their guns. Um, And I recognized then that it was a small set of law enforcement. And so we needed to root out um, the bad apples and to make sure that we could invest in the training and the retraining of law enforcement, um, reinvigorating this notion of community police officers giving incentives for officers to live in communities um, so that um, neighbors know who they are and feel that they can come to them and that they are you know, part of, uh, part of a community. There are all kinds of things that we can do um, to make law enforcement much more effective in our well, communities. Congresswoman, I hope you, you're so busy, you may not have seen this, and it did not get the kind of uh, press attention that it should have. But Over the past few weeks, 
Baltimore County Executive John Oshevsky Jr. unveiled a program that is right exactly what you're talking about in terms of training that I think has the potential to become a national model. And that is he set up a partnership with the Baltimore County Public Schools, the Community College of Baltimore County, the Baltimore County Police Department, and now they're in discussions with Towson University to even expand it to train from Jump Street homegrown police officers who will be community-centered police officers invested in the community so that you'll have sort of a, a, a farm system giving you high-quality police officers year after year after year. Sort of like year. ROTC sort of? And, yeah, all, and, and these partner, yes, and these complex partnerships beginning in high school, working with the community college, working with the police, and then working with Towson University so that you have these highly trained community-centered police officers. And I'm hoping as you get to Congress, you, you take a look at that and see what Johnny's done and see if there's not a way to expand that to uh, on a broader basis, because I think that has real potential. Well, I think one of the things that you have to look at with law enforcement training is it's not a one-time thing. Um, training has to take place over and over and over again. And a change of culture um, uh, from a change of of confrontation and bad practices into working with communities. Communities who are facing crime want law enforcement officers who are responsive to the crime that's happening in their communities. What they don't want are law enforcement officers, you know, stopping people for unreasonable uh, reasons, making it up, um, you know, abusing the community. Um, and in some instances resulting in people losing their lives. And so I think that there is a way to, you know, to do this, that um, invest in communities and community policing so that it's much more effective um, in terms of um, what happens in our communities. And look, we also have to demilitarize the police. Um, I, you know, I was one of a lonely group of members of Congress who fought very early on to demilitarize the police, to stop selling defense department weapons to local law enforcement. Look, I, I went to a community one time with all of these this weaponry displayed and I had just returned from Afghanistan. And let me tell you, the soldiers in Afghanistan had nothing over um, the I, weapons that were at that police department. Could not, could not agree more. I used to call them both as chief of staff and county executive, the, the toys of war that we were, that were dishing out all across the country. Listen, I know we've got to run. Before we do, we've got a question of the week for everybody coming on uh, the show today. Super Bowl halftime show. Thumbs up, oh. thumbs down. Where are you? Okay, let me just say, I use the Super Bowl halftime show to like get my energy level up for call time for the campaign. You and Nestor. <laughs> so I re I replay I've replayed it so many times. What was really interesting to me is like I I was shocked that I knew the words to like every <laughs> single song. But the reason I have to attribute it to my son as we were commuting together and he was growing up, I felt like I had to listen to the music he was listening to so that I could make sure I was listening to the music. He so was you could make to. mom spaghetti is what exactly. you could do. Probably. And so, you know, when Eminem came on, I was I was <laughs> sitting in my den. <laughs> Nestor, you were there. What did it feel like in the stadium? It was just it was electric. I mean, you know, it was, it's the Super Bowl. What's it's great? L.A. It, it was a, a crowd pleaser. I mean, more so than most anything, uh, you know, I think over the years in regard to being inside. Donna Fern Edwards is our guest. I, last thing for you, because you're running in the fourth, and I did call it PG, and I came down. I spent some time with you. So much has changed, right? And even 12 years from even where we sat and had a crab cake where I watched Bruno Mars shake it up the hill, uh, which I hope to come down there in August and, and redo that again with you uh, on the Maryland Crab Cake Tour. But for your district and getting back in, what makes your district special or different than our district, especially given how the state is 
really a purple place. And, and, and certainly your county and, and PG County and your district bringing in parts of Anne Arundel County, very, very different than law, other, other parts of the state in many ways. Well, I, I mean, look, first of all, I would discuss, describe Prince George's County and, and the district now includes Prince George's County, a slice of the eastern part of Montgomery County and Anne Arundel County all the way to Annapolis. And so um, it is a wide ranging district, but there are a lot of shared concerns um, throughout the district. Look, I've lived here in Prince George's County for 40 years. In fact, I've actually shopped at the same grocery store living in a apartment, a townhouse, a condo, and a single family home. Shopping still in the same neighborhood, in the same neighborhood. And I love my neighborhood, but we all love our neighborhoods. And um, Prince George's County offers an awful lot in terms of an economic engine uh, for the state. Montgomery County has that huge, you know, tech sector. And of course, Anne Anne Arundel County has, you know, a large part of the um, national security infrastructure, the Naval Academy, and of course, our, our capital. And so it's a great district to represent. I'm sure every member of Congress says that their district is the best. And so I'm not gonna leave that behind. The fourth congressional district is the best and I hope people will go out on June 28th and vote for Donna Edwards for Congress. My website is Donna Edwards, the number four congress.com. Donna, we you appreciate repeat, you. And, repeat uh, that one more time. That's for, well, let, let, it's, it's on the sign. Donna Edwards for, yeah, it's up there. Donna Edwards think my eyes, for you think my They'll eyes. find her, believe me, they'll find Say it her. over and over again, Donna Edwards for Congress.com. Donna I'm gonna Edwards I'm going to bring Moeller down and we're going to get him on the big wheel there and we're going to take <laughs> him up the go. hill. We're going to go for a walk heart. on the water. How about that? I love it. Great. Donna, we really spring, appreciate you. Spring time at the harbor. Congresswoman Donna Edwards, we promised her we'd get out of this window here. Of course, Don Moeller, my... Uh, my partner, uh, on behalf of all of our sponsors and our friends at State Fair, where I had a phenomenal Valentine's night, still eating some of the leftover chocolate <laughs> strawberries from our friends at Wise Markets as well. We are WNST, AM 1570, Towson, Baltimore, and we never stop talking. Baltimore, positive.